are uh, concluding our series on prayer, and uh, we have spent the last uh, 10 weeks, 10 weeks diving into this um, topic of communication with God. This is probably uh, one of my favorite studies out of all the studies I've done uh, through the Bible, just talking about the topics. And uh, you have in front of you or in your bulletin, you've got a verse booklet. And uh, this is kind of the recap of, uh, of these last 10 weeks or so. I have to tell you that, um, that there, is, uh, there is nothing like talking to God. And uh, we have a privilege as Christians to be able to talk to our Lord. And it's a shame that so many Christians don't exercise this wonderful privilege that we have to be able to talk to Him. And it's, uh, it's one thing to talk about prayer, and it's quite another to practice it. And I hope that the messages these last 10 weeks have, uh, have encouraged you to, uh, to pray and to talk to your Lord. And uh, we gave out these wristbands a while back, and the wristbands just say to saturate. It's our theme for this year. And if you haven't got one, uh, we'd like to make sure that you get one before you leave this place to remind you to saturate yourself in, uh, in prayer. And that's one of the things we've been talking about is just to saturate ourselves in prayer. And uh, I have a lot of material. I, I mentioned to my wife as I was putting this all together, and I'm only putting together the main points and some of the subpoints. And I said to her, I said, this is going to be a three-hour message, honey. And she said, so we're not doing communion. I said, no, 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 we're not doing communion, that's for sure. And uh, I was talking to Maxine. I said, you guys are going to have to hang on to your hats because... Um, I'm going to try to blow through this content, okay? So this is a recap of the last 10 weeks. So we began 10 or 11 weeks ago, rather, talking about uh, the function of prayer. We talked part one was the function of prayer. And I gave you three main points that we need to consider. Number one is the communication. Number two is the communion. And three was the command. Uh, the communication. This is the way that we communicate to God. Uh, there is no other way to communicate to him. And uh, regardless of, of what, uh, what Christians might think, we're, uh, we have not been given the privilege to email him. We haven't been given the privilege to text your Lord. We haven't been given the privilege to sit down and write a copy of a note and, and, uh, and, and, and mail it to him uh, snail mail style. The only means by which you communicate to God is through prayer. And uh, so many Christians, they just avoid this. So many Christians do not pray to God, though it's the only means by which we can communicate to Him. And if prayer really is communication with God, then we need to do it, and we need to do it often. If there was but one way to communicate to my wife, and that was through sending her a letter, I would be sending her letters all the time, because that's the only means to communicate. And so it is with prayer is the only way we can communicate to God. So we need to pray, and we need to pray more. And uh, I put a little note, hopefully it's on your verse sheets, the busier we get, the less we pray, but the more prayer is needed. And so don't use, don't use uh, a busy life for a reason why it is you don't pray. We should be praying more the busier we get. Uh, secondly, the communion. The communion, the function of prayer is communion. Uh, Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. This is how we commune with God, fellowship with him. And we need to be doing more of that. And thirdly, it's the command. The command. The Bible speaks of uh, all sorts of commands to pray, speaks of all sorts of commandments. And uh, Within the context of prayer, there's all sorts of commands to pray. Here are just a few of them. Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, uh, pray without ceasing. In Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint, right? So pray all the time. Pray without ceasing, watch and pray, and men ought always to pray and not to faint. John R. Rice said this, he says, my greatest Sin and yours is prayerlessness. Is prayerlessness. And uh, friends, I want to encourage you that if uh, you're here today and you don't pray as much as you should, uh, that is a tremendous sin against God. God commanded in his Bible for us to pray to him. And then when we don't follow through with his commands, that is a sin. 
And this is one of our greatest problems is prayerlessness. As a nation, as a, as a family, as a church, as individuals, we need to pray. We need to pray more often. He commanded us to do it, so let's do it as unto the Lord. Secondly, we talked about the part two was the foundation of prayer. So part one was the function of prayer. Part two was the foundation of prayer. And I mentioned to you that as a, as a former contractor, one of the most important things when, when building a building is laying the foundation. If you have a weak foundation, you'll have a collapsed structure. So we have to make sure that the, that the foundation is right. And, and you know, the foundation is something that you do not see, right? So the things that you do not see affect the things that you do see. And I tell you this, friends, that, that a lot of Christians who are struggling in their lives, and there's a lot of things maybe that are, that are open and, and before everybody, and they say, you know, my life is in shambles, and, and I, just don't, uh, I just don't feel connected with God. And, and you have to ask him, you have to ask him the question. Let me ask you, how's your prayer life? Are you praying to God? And they say, well, it's not as it ought to be. And I'll say this, that it's my life, prayer life, isn't as it ought to be. And I thank God for this series because this series has pushed me to pray more and to accept the invite to be able to talk to our Lord. But let me tell you what, friends, that the foundation is important. And when it comes to the foundation of prayer, we have to make sure we know why we are praying. And, and uh, when it comes to prayer, knowing what God can do begins by knowing who he is. So we have to look as a whole, contextually, as who God is and, and some of the things about God. And, and the more we get to know about him and who he is, the more we know what he can do in answer to our prayer. And it's unfortunate that so many people, uh, they, they, they have twisted a a view of God. They have a twisted view of God, and they, they look at God as, as uh, some mean ogre, as someone who's unloving and, and hateful. And, and uh, so I just put down a couple things here. Point one was the faithfulness of the Savior. Uh, that was so many weeks ago, and yet I, I just absolutely love this point, the faithfulness out, uh, of the Savior. Uh, without knowing uh, why God is faithful or without knowing these characteristics, we will never completely appreciate his conduct. Why would you pray to, an, to a faithless Savior? He is very faithful, and, and in some of the areas he's faithful, I've got him listed here. First of all, he has this limitless love. Uh, and uh, underneath the limitless love, a subpoint was the eternal love. In John 13, 1, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And knowing that God has a limitless eternal love helps me to pray. I wouldn't pray to a God who didn't love me. What about a great love? Philippians 2, 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. I wouldn't pray to a God who didn't greatly love me. And then he has sacrificial love. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. So his limitless love is made up of eternal love, great love, and sacrificial love. We also looked at his grand goodness in Exodus 34, 6. And his goodness alone should be a reason why we pray. Because God is a good God. Matter of fact, he is a great God who loves us with a perfect love, a limitless love, an eternal, sacrificial, great love. I'm so thankful for that. And we look at his measureless mercy, his measureless mercy in Psalm 136, 1. You know, so many people think that God is not a merciful God. They look at God as, uh, as he just is not merciful to people. And you know, really, we are the beneficiary. He's the benefactor. He wants to be merciful to us. And I'm thankful that he has measureless mercy, mercy that you, you cannot measure. It is, um, it is so big, so vast, and he wants to display that for us. So the foundation of prayer is built on the faithfulness of the Savior, but it's also built on the, the failure of the sinner. If it wasn't for the failure of the sinner, there would be no need for the faithfulness of the Savior. You know, we all fail. Everyone in this room, I fail and, and, and you all fail. None of us are perfect. 
And in so many areas, we need the faithfulness of a Savior because of our failures. And we looked at several of them. We looked at the sin of independence, the sin of idolatry, the sin of immorality, the sin of ignorance, the sin of irresponsibility. And all of these things are just the, just the, the basics, just the basics. We are a, 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 a society, a culture that, that is not perfect before God. And because we are not perfect before God, we need his faithfulness. And we need that amazing character of God. We need his limitless love, his grand goodness, and his measureless mercy. And without that, I wouldn't pray to him. I'm not going to pray to a God that does not love me, is not good, and is not merciful. I am only going to pray to a God that I know to be true to the Scripture, who is all these things, who has eternal love, great love, and sacrificial love. This is the God that I'm going to pray to. And his name is Jesus. I thank God for that. I thank God for that. So we looked at the foundation of prayer. So the, the function and the foundation. Third, we looked at the faith of prayer. The faith of prayer. Uh, faith isn't just important to prayer, it's essential to prayer. It's essential for pleasing God. If you want to please God, you have to have faith in your prayer. And it's essential for obeying God. So we looked at two main things here in part three, the faith of prayer. We looked at the education of faith and the exercise of faith. First of all, we must remember with the education of faith that um, the disciples lacked faith. Now, can you imagine just for a moment that you are in Jesus' time and, and he is uh, standing here in front of you and you are just one of these fishermen who are out on the, uh, out on the, the shore and, and uh, he calls you along and he's going to start showing you just tremendous miracles and yet they lacked faith. It's hard to believe that, isn't it? Like you see the Lord right here. Uh, he heals the blind and he, and he makes the lame to walk again and, and brings back the dead. Uh, and, and yet at the same time, you have a group of disciples in the presence of Jesus who lacks faith. You know what this tells me? Underneath the, the, the education is that faith is a growing process. Faith is a growing process. And I'm thankful for that too, and here's why. Because I have not arrived I have not arrived. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. We all need to be helped in our unbelief. So we notice here that the disciples uh, lacked faith and they had to grow. Secondly, under the education of faith, uh, we must remember that even the disciples didn't know how to pray. <laughs> even the disciples, in, in Luke 11, 1, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Or teach us to pray. Uh, this was a great quote. D.L. Moody said this. He said, We are not told that Jesus ever taught his disciples how to preach, but he taught them how to pray. And, and this, this means a lot to me coming from Bible college where they never had a prayer class. They had a preaching class. They taught men how to preach, but they never taught them how to pray. They just expect us to learn that by accident. You know what happens when, when someone doesn't teach you how to pray outside of God? Here's what happens. They tend to mimic people's prayers. And they're very shallow. And they tend to learn the language of prayer. This is, this is how you're supposed to pray. And, and prayer is our communion with God, our communication with God. It's a command from God. And we need to go to him and just talk to him. Like he's our... Loving Heavenly Father. Never had a class on how to pray. Had plenty of classes on how to preach and not sure they did me all that good anyway. We looked at the education of faith. We looked at the exercise of faith. The exercise of faith. Faith first comes through knowing God's word. All right? Uh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to hear the word of God to grow in your faith and then you're going to pray more. Isn't that neat? We need to do this. The authority of God's word is vital to your prayer life. And people who say, uh, well, I pray all the time. And then you say, well, how much time are you spending in God's word? And they say, well, I don't spend a whole lot of time in God's word. Well, there is a problem. <laughs> how do you know what to pray for? How do you know that your prayers are actually 
doing what they ought to be doing. And I gave you some things here. They, they should be on your verse sheet. Uh, first of all, get to know God's Word better. And I mentioned that we need to read the Bible, we need to memorize the Bible, and meditate on the Bible, right? Get to know God. Faith comes by hearing God's Word. So we want as much of God's Word as we can in our lives. This is going to help you. It's going to help you to pray. Secondly, remember uh, what He's done for you in the past. It's amazing how forgetful we are of all of the wonderful things God has done for us. But when we look back, and we look back and we say, I remember that God did this for me. That's going to help you. It's going to help you. And thirdly, I mentioned just get out of God's way and let him do what he's really good at doing. George Mueller says that uh, before one can pray, one's heart must have, quote, no will of its own regarding, or reg in regard to a given matter. End quote. Meaning this, that when you pray, you have to remove yourself from the equation. You have to remove yourself from the equation. You have to get to know God. You have to exercise your faith as soon as you've been educated in faith. So that was part three, the faith of prayer. Part four was the focus of prayer. This is probably one of my favorite uh, messages, I think because of the load of application that's in this, the focus of prayer. We looked at a couple things. We looked at the pattern of focused prayer, and we looked at the place of focused prayer. So the pattern of focused prayer, uh, and here's just a, a couple of examples. Uh, Jesus patterned this for us. He prayed in the wilderness, didn't he, in Luke 5, 15 through 16, and Jesus also prayed on a mountain. And uh, in Luke 6, 12, and R.A. Torrey said that nights of prayer to God are followed by days of power with men. It always is amazing to me how, how spiritually strong I feel after a long time in prayer. How much peace I have in my life. How much focus spiritually I have in my life after a long time in prayer. And uh, so this is just part of the pattern of focused prayer. Uh, I... We hear this all the time, location, 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 right? Well, this is true when it comes to your prayer life. Make sure that you're praying in, uh, at times just away from, from all the activity, and we'll get to a little bit more of that in a second. Uh, Jesus also said that prayer should be done in a closet in uh, Matthew 6, 5 to 6. And we need to get alone with our Lord to have the quality time with Him, don't we? We need to get alone with the Lord to have quality time with Him. Uh, this is wonderful for a lot of reasons. Some men uh, pray to be praised of other men for their praying. Uh, how many times has someone come to you and been like, man, that is just a really good prayer, and, and man, just, that was, that's just a solid prayer. And really what that often means is that uh, someone prayed a prayer that parroted another guy's prayer. And, and basically it sounded very eloquent. It was, it was very topical, but had no depth to it. And because it sounded so good. And so get away and find that place. Here's what's important. I made a note on your verse sheets. Uh, here's what's important, that you, that you have a place to pray where you can focus. You need to focus on your praying. We looked at the place of focus prayer, point two. I mentioned this. We need to silence uh, verbal distractions, Mark 6, 30 and 32. And uh, we need to get away from the crowds, don't we? The power of our prayer will be determined in large degree by our private retreats. One guy said this. He said, getting alone with God requires getting away from others. And, and so often, you know, we need to pray without ceasing. And that's, that's just no joke. We need to do that all the time. But you know what? Sometimes prayer is done best in a place designated solely for praying. And sometimes people say, well, I, I pray while I'm driving. Well, that's good. But you cannot focus on praying when you're driving. Amen? You don't want to focus on prayer when you're driving. You want to be driving. And I think it's great. I think you should pray while you're driving. But I don't think that you should focus on your prayer while you're driving. I think that we need to get away. We need to silence all of these distractions. We need to, at times, get away just him and I. Where there's nothing else. Where you turn off the internet. We turn off your phone. We need to focus, though, on prayer. We need to silence verbal distractions. We also need to reduce visual distractions. And I know that this probably seems uh, silly because you close your eyes, right? Of course you're going to silence or reduce, rather, your visual distractions. You're going to close your eyes and you're going to pray. But let me tell you what. You, if you do not 
get rid of all of those things. I, you know, it'd be like asking a lady to pray in front of a pile of laundry or asking a, a guy to pray as he's underneath a car changing the oil. You know what I mean? It just doesn't work that way. There's too many distractions in our lives. There's not enough quietness, and we need to get to a point where we can not only silence the verbal distractions, but reduce the visual distractions. Psalm 141.8 says, But mine eyes are unto thee, O God the Lord. My eyes are there. I'm looking at the Lord. Not at a project, not at the road, trying to drive down the road at 65 miles an hour, because that's the speed limit. So 65 miles an hour, you'd only get that if you were here for Sunday school. The focus of prayer was part four. Part five was the fervency. I'm sorry, the, the, uh, yeah, the fervency of prayer. The fervency of prayer. Uh, without question, this is an area that we have reduced to nothing. Uh, the fervency of prayer is, is, uh, is lacking in every Christian's life. And uh, my wife went in for a, a mammogram a few weeks ago, and uh, that was on like a Wednesday or Thursday. Monday, they said they found a spot. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, Monday morning, 8.30, we get this phone call. I didn't think about anything the rest of the week. I'm not even sure what happened the rest of that week, except I was fervent in my prayers. And uh, we went in to do the follow-up, and uh, I brought a book with me, and I'm thinking, like, I'm going to actually read in the waiting room. My wife's back there figuring out what the spot is, right? That didn't happen. And uh, for several days, I was praying, and, and finally, I just continued to pray and pray and pray, and, and my wife walks out with a million-dollar smile. Usually, she's got about a $100,000 smile. That was a million-dollar smile, and I knew. I'm like, praise God. And I, told, I looked at her. I said, I am just tired. And she looked at me. She says, fervent prayer is exhausting, isn't it? I said, it is. I said, it really is. I thank God for that, though. I thank God that we can do that. And can I just say this as well, that, that if, if, if she came out with a, with, a, with a smile that looked like negative a million dollars, if there was a problem, it wouldn't make God any less good. He is good regardless of what happens to her, regardless of what happens to me. And I know in times of trouble, it's hard to sift through all that and to, and to just trust in God, but regardless, he's good. He's good all the time. I'm thankful for her. For him, we need to take prayer seriously. We need to have fervency in our prayers, fervency in our prayers. We looked at the parable of a judge, uh, Luke 18, 1 to 8, and this was the parable of a judge who heard the petition of, of the widow who was crying night and day and, and was begging uh, the, the judge for an answer, and he gave in, and, and this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to be fervent in our prayers. And I, I mentioned on your verse sheets, hopefully that's there, uh, uh, that a, a fervent prayer life is one of the best indicators of your faith. A fervent prayer life is one of the best indicators of your faith. It's, it's, it's a good standard. It's a good mark that says this person really believes, really believes that God can answer his prayers. And so those people who are fervent in prayers usually have just a solid uh, spiritual life. We also gave you the example of a prophet so not just the parable of a judge, but the example of a prophet. Prophet In James 5, 16, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I mentioned that passionate prayer is powerfully productive, that we need to be passionate about our prayer life. And when we are passionately praying, there are usually results, positive ones. Powerfully productive. Charles Spurgeon said, look well to it that you really pray and do not learn the language of prayer. I mentioned that already. That so many times we just learn the language of prayer. We learn what is supposed to be said, right? Quote, unquote, supposed to be said. It's like a husband who brings flowers home to his wife because that's what he's supposed to do. Or maybe a wife who, who gets up in the morning and maybe makes coffee and breakfast for her husband because that's what she is supposed to do. This is the language of a relationship. And not all languages are spoken in the same way. There's a lot of husbands who get up and make their breakfast for their wives. I don't know many wives who bring flowers home to their husbands, but I suppose that's always, always a possibility. Um, here's what I'm simply saying is that there needs to be a fervency in our prayer life. There needs to be fervency. You need to pray and really mean what you're praying. Uh, we also looked at the frequency of prayer, the frequency of prayer. And I mentioned that a lack of prayer is generally due to a lack of priority. 
If we are not, if we are not prioritizing prayer in our life, we have, there's, there's a much greater problem. And I also said that when your priorities are straight, your prayer life will be strong. You make sure your priorities are right. And one of the things that you're going to prioritize is your prayer life. Because it's that important. Because there is no other way to communicate to God. There's no other way. And if you want to talk to your Lord, you need to put at the top of your list prayer. It's amazing when I look at somebody's calendar, oftentimes you don't see a, a, a slot for praying. And, uh, and since this series, I've been praying more and more and more and more. And you know, one of the things that we've talked about, my wife and I, I talked about actually having, and, and on some of my calendars already, there's a slot for prayer where I can focus on prayer, where I know that that time is allocated to God. We need to pray with frequency and make sure that it's a priority. I mentioned pray always, pray for everything, and pray without ceasing. Pray always, pray for everything, and pray without ceasing. And pray always, I said that in, in uh, Proverbs 30, uh, or 20, I'm sorry, 21, 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but the safety is of the Lord. Uh, we need to pray all the time, pray always, uh, some people have said, well, there are times where you don't really feel like praying. I don't know how many of you do that, where you wake up maybe and you just say, boy, I just don't, I don't feel like I'm, I'm in the spirit of prayer. And just because you're not in the spirit of prayer doesn't mean that you don't need to pray. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, he said this, if your hearts be cold in prayer, do not restrain prayer until your heart warms, but pray your soul unto heat. And he says, if the iron be hot, then hammer it. And if it be cold, hammer it until you heat it. So even if you're not feeling like it's time to pray, get on your knees and start praying to God. And I tell you what, it'll warm up. Your prayer life will increase. So pray always. Pray for everything. Uh, it, was, it was cute. Just the, the previous week before this, there was a little girl named Isabel who was praying for a stuffed animal in our, in our Wednesday night prayer service. And I used her as an example on Sunday morning. She won't know it until later on in life, but uh, it was really, really cute. And what that tells me is there's a tenderness there. There's a tenderness, a spirit about her that says that this is real to me, and God is real, and I can just bring everything I need to him. I can pray for everything. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be careful for nothing. That means don't worry about anything. But in everything, that means even for your stuffed animal, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. You can always pray for everything. So pray always, pray for everything. Uh, Corey Tinboom said this, any concern too small to be turned into prayer is too small to be made into a burden. So pray always for everything. And then pray without ceasing. Uh, here's this command I mentioned to you in the beginning, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, that pray without ceasing. When we are most dependent on prayer, we are most frequent in our prayers, right? So continue to pray. I remember when after I got done preaching this message, my kids turned to me and they said, Dad, isn't praying always the same as pray, pray without ceasing? And I said, well, so, sort of, kids. I said, don't lip off to me. I'm your father. <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that. I said, you know what, guys? Actually, there is a lot of similarities there. But praying always without ceasing is kind of like the, it's kind of like the catalyst for just do it all the time for everything. Don't ever stop. And that's how I said it to them. No, I didn't say it like that to them. I just say it like that to you. Anyway, number seven, the failure of prayer. The failure with prayer. We're doing all right here. The failure of prayer. Uh, I mentioned a couple things. First of all, that we don't pray right. And then secondly, that we don't live right. We don't pray right and we don't live right. In James 4, uh, 2 to 3, it says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight in war, Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lusts. Uh, here's what we're saying here, is that we worship the wrong God. We worship the wrong God. That was a sub-point of we pray right. We worship the wrong God. In a sense, we are worshiping the gods of stuff. That's what's happening. We are worshiping the gods of stuff. And uh, unfortunately, we have become a society that we are always... Uh, uh, seeking pleasure, and uh, we're not worshiping the right God. We're actually worshiping the wrong God, and uh, 
we also looked at we pray for the wrong goods. So we worship the wrong God and we pray for the wrong goods. And that's really in verse 3. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your own lust. And uh, I think this is another reason prayers fail is because we're asking that we may get something out of it. We're asking how does it benefit me? And I think we've all had prayers like that at times, and I gave you a couple examples that Sunday of, of, of things and ways that we pray that maybe we have too much of ourselves in our prayers. And R.A. Torrey said that a selfish purpose in prayer robs prayer of its power. And so when you pray, it's not about what I can get out of it. Remember, we're offering prayers to God for, for whatever it is we're praying for, but I, Lord, I, I don't want to look out for myself I'm going to look out for uh, others around me. So we have to be careful not to uh, pray too much of ourselves into our prayers. So uh, we don't pray right, number one. Number two, we don't live right. And uh, a person cannot live any way they want and just expect God to answer all their prayers. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people that do that. They, they, they live in just uh, worldliness and sin and carnality and, and they have no respect of the things of God and yet at the same time they pray asking him for things. And uh, the subpoint under that was there are people who are enjoying wickedness. And uh, Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And uh, sinning without regards to the consequences of our sin will hinder our prayers. And uh, so many people do that. We, we just go out there, we sin, and, and, I, and, I, and I say we. We all do that. And then we expect God to hear our prayers. Uh, not only are people out enjoying wickedness because, and they're not living right, but people are not honoring their wives. And I mentioned 1 Peter 3, 7, and these are just a couple things, but uh, men's prayers are hindered for the lack of honoring their wives. And uh, it's a shame that men are out there and they, they don't honor their wives, and yet their prayers, it says that your prayers be not hindered in that verse, in verse uh, 7 of 1 Peter 3. And uh, a few verses later in verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Uh, one commentator said, if, if on the other hand we turn a deaf ear to his precepts, he will likely turn a deaf ear to our prayers. And how is it that we are supposed to pray to a God that we are not obedient to? We're not living right. And so we need to live right before the Lord. We looked at the formula of prayer, the formula of prayer. That was part eight. I mentioned three really important things. First of all, the need for confession, number one. Number two, the need for calibration. And number three, the need for confidence. The need for confession. Uh, powerful prayer is the result of pure hands. Uh, confession comes from a humble heart, and a humble heart confesses their wrongdoing. And so if you want to have a formula for prayer, if you want to have prayers that are answered, we got to go to God and we have to confess our sin to him. Uh, proud people lack power in their prayer. It's just true. Uh, how, how can a person get right with God if they're not willing to admit their wrongdoing? And so we need to get right with God. We need to confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9 and 10 says that, that we need to confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Um, we shouldn't be asking for more uh, from the person we've offended until we get right with him. I gave you the illustration of my kids who maybe have taken money out of my wallet. This is not a true statement, right? Anyway, so I gave you this example, and uh, maybe they take money out of my wallet, but I will never, will never have restored fellowship and they come, until they come to me and say, Dad, I've, I've wronged you, so they need to confess their sins. So there's a need for confession, and I bet everybody in this room, including me, need to confess some sins to God. And maybe at times we need to confess some sins to other people. Maybe other people we've wronged. And uh, can I tell you this, that my, one of the things I start out my prayer with is a confession of my wrongdoing. And uh, God forbid that we go to God and we start asking for things when, before we've gotten right with Him. So when you pray, you begin to confess your sin to the Lord and say, Lord, I've wronged, I've done this, and, and Lord, I want to be right with you, and I, and I know you forgive me, but I have to get right, and I've just got to confess my wrongdoing. So there's a need for confession. There's also a need for calibration. Uh, in two ways. Number one, spiritual calibration. Uh, it's amazing spiritual people have their prayers answered, isn't it? Uh, people who, the, the giants of the faith, they say, man, I pray and God moves. Well, it's because you're right with the Lord and you're spiritually calibrated. Uh, spiritual calibration is walking 
in the Spirit and having a relationship with the Lord, right? So uh, it's, it's being obedient, spiritually calibration, or spiritual calibration. 1 John 3, 22 says this, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Keeping his commandments, do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You are spiritually calibrated. There's also a need for scriptural calibration, being scripturally calibrated. Uh, one commentator said if we would, uh, would have power in prayer, we must be earnest students of his word to find out what his will regarding us is and then having found it to do it, right? So the will of God for our lives pours out of God's word. So we go to him and we look for his word, we look into his word, we find out what he has for us. And we do that by 2 Timothy 2.15, studying to show yourself approved unto God. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Uh, R.A. Torrey says that uh, feed the fire of our prayers with fuel of God's word. Uh, what better way to pray than to know exactly what to pray for? What better way to pray than to go to God and say, Lord, I, I, I'm just searching for, for the right questions to ask. And you do that through uh, searching his word. I mentioned a couple other things to consider is uh, forgiveness and thanksgiving. We need to be forgiving of others and be thankful for what God's already done. Can you imagine uh, continually doing for some, something for somebody who's not thankful for what you've already done? And, and, and it's a shame to say that uh, you know, there, there's, there's always a, a prayer meeting, isn't there? But, but how often is there a praise meeting? How often is there where a, a group of people come together and they say, thank God for what you've done? And, and I'll tell you that a lot of my prayers, when I pray through the lists of people in this church, no kidding, when I, I land on people and I, in most of my prayers, not necessarily praying for a specific need, but thanking God for that person. There's some people in this room, I don't know exactly what your needs are. But you know what, I'm thankful that you're here. And I'm thankful that you love the Lord and that you're growing in him. So we need to praise him and be thankful for that. There's also the need for confidence. And I think it's clear that when we pray, we must believe that what we're asking we'll receive. Uh, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So pray and believe that God is going to give them to you. Okay? So that's important, the formula. Lastly, look at this, we're almost out of time. The freedom, the freedom of prayer. This is what I ended on last week. Freedom from our anxiety, number one, and freedom from our ability, number two. Prayer gives us freedom from our anxiety. Uh, boy, I, I tell you, w people who worry a lot and are the, uh, the, the worry wart, <laughs> so to speak, uh, they, they're, they're anxious all the time and they have a lot of things to fret. You know what the God says? He says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. You know how liberating that is? You know how freeing that is to be able to, to bring things to God in prayer? To be able to cast your cares upon somebody who actually cares for you. And many of us get entrenched in these phone calls and, uh, and, and we're calling and, and the, the, the customer service person answers the phone and, and, uh, and if, they, if, if they speak English, it, sometimes it's just kind of rough and, and, uh, and you, try to, you try to voice your concern to these people. And sometimes you just wonder, do they even care? <laughs> and you know what's great is that we can cast our cares upon God and we know definitively that he cares for me. I wouldn't cast my cares on someone who didn't care for me. Uh, we looked at that joy comes from God, and, and, and so many times people try to fill their lives with things that don't create joy. And Psalm 1611 is great for that. Uh, John R. Rice said this, he says, your discouragement is really just a lack of, your, of, of God's nearness and assurance. So when you don't have the joy of the Lord, when you, when you are being discouraged, when you feel discouraged, it has uh, a lot to do with your nearness uh, to God. We also looked at grace comes from God. And same phone calls, you're praying, you're, you're like, Lord, I don't even know if these people care for me. <laughs> you know, they're there, they're just gonna get a paycheck, and they have this tone about them, don't they? You know how some people, when they answer the phone, you just feel loved? <laughs> you know, like, you, people from the down south, is that, that's, that's, that's the way it is. He's like, 
hello, how can I help you? And you're just like, wow, you know, I think you actually care, you know? And you get some other people who just pick up the phone and be like, so-and-so accounting service, and you're like, uh, you don't care, do you? <laughs> and uh, so the same conversations, you're praying for God's grace, aren't you? And you say, Lord, I just need grace to be able to deal with these people. <laughs> so, Lord, please help me to be kind to them and to love them. And, and this is how you get grace. You pray for it. Hebrews 4, 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. People say, I don't have grace in my life. Have you been praying for it? Have you been praying for God's grace? Because there's no other way to get it. Freedom from our abilities. So we have freedom from our anxiety, and we also have freedom from our ability. And if you're human and in this room, which I'm assuming all of you are, and not from some UFO, uh, you have limitations. All of us have limitations. I'm probably the strongest one in the room, so you probably have more limitations than me. But that's a joke. I can't believe I have to tell you what a joke is, but anyway, we have freedom from, from our ability. See, you all just thought it was true. <laughs> just, I believe pastor. I believe him. I believe him. No, I'm probably the weakest in this room, but it, Josh is stronger than me. We had a contest. This is totally not in the notes. We had a contest on the lake, and the goal was to try to hang on to the inner tube the longest with one arm. Isn't that right? Who won? You won, you liar. You won. I, I let go. I couldn't hack it. But anyway, so I'm the weakest one in the room. Can't even beat up my 12-year-old son. So, we totally digressed. Um, God has no limitations, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, in, in Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. I'm thankful that we have a God who frees us from so many things, frees us, frees us from our anxiety and frees us from our abilities. I'm thankful for God. I'm thankful that we have prayer. I'm thankful that when we, we can go to him and we can have a clear conscience. And if we don't, we can get right with him and we can confess our sin. I'm thankful that he is all-powerful and he can answer all of our prayers. I'm thankful I got done with this message. That was 10 weeks in 45 minutes. That's not bad. I just love the Lord. You know, I never, I never have enough time with him. It's just true. It's true. I, I feel that if you're anything like me, the day just goes by. My kids asked me, I said, Dad, why is it the older you get, the faster time goes? And I said, just wait for it. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I, I wake up and I go right back to sleep again. And it's not because it's 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, there was a, a whole day in there somewhere. And the Bible says that life is but a vapor. It appears for a short time and then vanishes away. One of the things we, we should know before we leave this place is where you're going to spend eternity. You're going to spend an eternity somewhere. And we have a lot of privilege right now on this, on this earth. We have a lot of privilege. We can talk to our Creator. How neat is that? So many other religions, you, you don't talk to their Creator. Their Creator is still in a tomb somewhere. And the wonderful thing about Christianity, verifiably, our Savior lives. He's not in the tomb. The tomb's empty. And then he gives us a means by which we can communicate to him. And so often it's taken for granted. But one day we're going to meet him. One day we're going to have to stand before him. He's going to look at us and he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? And there's going to be a lot of people in that day that say, Lord, Lord, I have done many marvelous works. I've done all of these things. And you know what the Lord's going to say to those people who have done a bunch of works to earn their salvation? He's going to say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. For I never knew you. 
And I'm so thankful that we can know for sure we're going to heaven when we die. You know, the gospel never gets old. It may seem repetitive, but if it's the most important thing, then it ought to be voiced all the time. There are a lot of churches that say if you give money or if you raise a hand or pray a prayer or if you get baptized, you go to heaven. There's a lot of churches that say it's all about what you can do to earn your salvation. I want this hand to represent you and me. I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we all have sin. As clear and plain as day, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's in the Bible, Romans 3. The Bible says that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone. And there are churches that say, well, just turn over a new leaf. The problem is, is here you are with your sin, just turned over. Some people say, well, get water baptized, and they get water baptized, and, but that doesn't wash away their sin. Some people say, well, if you give money to the church, you'll go to heaven. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the wages of this sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of this sin is death. The payment for sin is death. Not giving money, not raising a hand, or walking an aisle, or praying a prayer, or getting baptized, or turning over a new leaf, or walking little old people across the street. It's not about becoming a member. The wages of sin is death. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to do the only thing that he could do to make the payment for our sin. And that was to die. He didn't give money to the church in order to make the payment for your sin. He didn't walk an aisle. He didn't get baptized to make a payment for your sin. He died on the cross, was buried in the grave to make the payment for your sin. And the Bible says, for by grace are you saved not through church membership, not through walking an aisle, not through praying a prayer, but you're saved by faith in Christ alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast, meaning this, that there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. Jesus made the payment for you. And all you need to do is believe that he did. It's the only thing you can do without doing anything at all. It's belief. It's trusting in him that he died for you. There's no work there on our part. It's simple faith in what Jesus has done. That he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again three days later. And that's a miracle. Nobody would have done that for you. Nobody could have done that for you. Because he didn't have sin to pay for of his own, he was able to pay for ours. And the only way he could do that is by dying on the cross for our sin. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, you could stack up all of the good works, all of the effort you've done throughout your whole life, and it wouldn't mean one bit in terms of your entrance to heaven. Because it's about what Jesus has done for us but him making the payment for us. The wages of sin is death. Not of turning from sin, not of living a good life, not of giving money, not of becoming a member, not getting baptized. Faith alone in Christ alone is the only thing that'll save you. And if you're here today, you don't know that. I'm just asking you that you'd place your faith in him as your savior. And you know, if you do that, you're saved forever. You become a child of God. Uh, John chapter 1, to as many as receive him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Wonderful. You become a child of God. Not because you worked for it, not because you're trying to keep it, because he died for you. And when you say in the quietness of your own mind, Lord, I believe that you died for me and I accept that free gift of salvation. It's a gift. We just receive it by faith. 
And I hope that you can do that. I hope that you've done that. And if you haven't done that, I pray that you'll do that today.